throughout most of this book, when Job is talking, he's defending God while still saying that he himself is righteous. He's talking about how God is just, how God is righteousness, but yet he still asserts his own correctness, his own determination that he hasn't done anything wrong. And this is the reason why his friends shut their ears and stop listening to him. This is why another man steps out and says, you've misunderstood who God is if you think that that's the point of all this. God continues in verse 22. Have you entered the storehouses of the snow or seen the storehouses of the hail, which are reserved for the times of trouble, for the days of war and battle? What is the way to the place where the lightning is dispersed, or the place where the east winds are scattered over the earth? Who cuts a channel for the torrents of rain and a path for the thunderstorm to water a land where no man lives in a desert with no one in it, to satisfy a desolate wasteland and make it sprout with black grass? Does the rain have a father? Who fathers the drops of dew? From whose womb comes the ice? Who gives birth to the frost from the heavens when the waters become hard as stone and when the surface of the deep is frozen? Can he bind the beautiful Pleiades? Can he loose the cords of Orion? Can you bring forth the constellations in their seasons, or lead out the bear with its cubs? Do you know how to know the laws of the heavens? Can you set up God's dominion over the earth? Can you raise your voice to the clouds and cover yourself in the flood of water? Do you send the lightning bolts on their way? Do they report to you, here we are? Who endowed the heart with wisdom or gave understanding to the mind? Who has the wisdom to count the clouds and can tip over the water jars of the heavens? When the dust becomes hard and the clods of earth stick together? Do you hunt the prey for the lioness and satisfy the hunger of the lions when they crouch in their dens or lie awake in the thicket? Who provides food for the raven when his young cry out to God and wander about for lack of food? He speaks to Job here in, in a tone like an eagle. He says, all right, you make your case. You tell me about how smart you are. And he says specifically there in that one part of the passage we looked at, do you make people smart? Do you endow the heart with wisdom in verse 36? Do you give understanding to the mind? God is telling Job, the very instrument by which you can defend yourself was given to you by me. That brain of yours that you're so smart with, that was my creation. I made that and I handed it to you. But go ahead, turn it around on me. Tell me how smart you are. Defend yourself. Verse 39. Do you know when the mountain goats give birth? Do you watch when the doe bears her fawn? Do you count the months till they bear? Do you know the time they give birth? They crouch down and bring forth their young. Their labor pains are ended. The young thrive and grow strong in the wild. They weave and do not return. Who let the wild donkeys go free? Who untied his ropes? I give him the wasteland as his home and the salt flats as his habitat. He laughs at the commotion of the town. He does not hear a driver's shout. He ranges the hills for his pasture and searches for any green thing. Will the wild ox consent to serve you? Will he say by your danger at night? Can you hold him to the furrow with a harness? Will he till the valleys behind you? Will you rely on him for his great strength? Will you leave your heavy work to him? Can you trust him to bring in your grain and gather it to your fresh and poor? The wings of the ostrich flap joyfully, but they cannot compare with the pinions and feathers of the stork. She lays her eggs on the ground and lets them warm in the sand, unmindful that a foot may crush them, that some wild animal may trample them. She treats her young harshly, as if they were not hers. She cares not that her labor was in vain. For God did not endow her with wisdom, or give her a share of good sense. Yet when she spreads her feathers to run, she laughs at horse and rider. Do you give the horse his strength, or clothe his neck with a flowing mane, to make him leap like a locust, striking terror with his proud snorting? He paws fiercely, rejoicing in his strength, and charges into the fray. He laughs in fear, afraid of nothing. He does not shy away from his The quiver rattles against his side, along with the flashing spear of the lance. In the frenzy of excitement, he eats up the ground. He cannot stand still with the trumpet sounds. Last of the trumpet sounds, he starts out hot. He catches the scent of battle from afar. The shout of commanders in the battle cry. Does the hawk take flight by your wisdom and spread his wings toward the south? Does the eagle soar at your command and build his nest on high? He dwells on a cliff and stays there at night. A rocky crag is his stronghold, and for 
from there he seeks out his food. His eyes detected from afar. His young ones feast on blood. And where the slain are, there is he. So we get this defense of himself from the Lord in the, all of these depictions of the natural world, the things that God has set to order, the things that only God knows every detail of. And he gives Job this pride. Did it explain to me how all these things work? Tell me how they're all ordered. Tell me how I did it. And Job, after all of this, and in fact another entire chapter of the Lord defending himself, eventually just says, I, I'm unworth it. I can't possibly defend myself against all of these things. I'm not wise enough. I'm not correct in saying any of these things. And God relents from the punishment and gives him all of that which had been taken from him and even more. But let me ask you this. Where is the patience of Job? Where is his perseverance or his stick to it this? How was Job hanging on and doing the right thing even through trials? I tell you that we haven't seen it yet in this course of the book. The patience of Job, I think that James is referring to in his letter, actually comes in the epilogue. God tests Job with all of these questions, as the devil had tested Job with all of these physical torments. God puts Job to the test by saying, bring your righteousness to me and weigh it against my power. Tell me how good you are, and I'll measure that against how well I've created this world and set it to order. So when God is putting this in front of Job, and Job has to relent and admit who God is and to humble himself, I think it's only after that that Job starts to be patient. And I'll show you what I mean by looking at that passage from James. James chapter 5 says this, James 5 starting in verse 7, Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm, because the Lord is coming is near. Don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we consider blessed those who have persevered. You've heard of Job's perseverance. I've seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Above all, my brothers, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or anything else, let your yes be yes and your no no, or you will be condemned. Throughout the passage, uh, or the entirety of Job's story, he keeps making these oaths. Well, if, if such and such happens, may the Lord strike me dead. If such and such happens, uh, may something bad befall me. There's one point in particular where Job says, if I ever so much as lusted after a woman, let somebody else come and take my life. He made all of these oaths and promises and curses against himself. He put himself in the position as being the, the righteous witness of his own righteousness. He testified to his own correctness before the Lord. And when after he had been humbled and God restored him, God gave him sons and daughters and flocks. But if any of you have ever raised a child, you know those things don't just sort of pop out of the earth. Job didn't have sons and daughters and flocks tomorrow. God didn't miraculously send him a horde of children. He didn't, you know, have uh, these things just sort of pop up out of the ground uh, and, and become a great legacy for him. This was a planting that took a harvest much later. This was growth that had to happen over time. The restoration of Job that happens in the epilogue is the perseverance that Job demonstrated. After he had humbled himself and God had shown him who God was, Joseph, Job then began to persevere. He then awaited for the promises that God had, was, had put before him that he would give him back 
everything he had lost, and in abundance. His humility before God opened up the way for God to pour out his blessings on him. And all of those things that God had used as his own defense against Job, and the accusation against Job and Job's bad attitude said, Job, if you're so smart, if you're so powerful, you do all these things and tell me how I do all these things. All of that was then turned as a tool in Job's benefit. All of the power of creation, all of the blessings of God, then became the thing that restored Job back onto his feet, gave him his legacy back, gave him his wealth, his power, his influence, all because of the humility that came. Now, Job never lost his righteousness under the law. Job, throughout all of these things, never disobeyed the Lord and broke his oaths to God. But what he was missing the whole time was a posture of heart that reflected where God wanted him to be. And that's the lesson for us now. Now, maybe God hasn't killed all your kids and taken your blocks and punished you with sores all over your body and made you miserable and sick and sad and put you in an ash heap. Maybe your friends don't have to come and console you every day about how bad your life is. But imagine, if you're already doing this good, how much more God could do for you if we would take on that much more humility in our lives. Remember what James was saying to the, his audience. He said you have to have patience like a farmer. You have to be willing to plant the seed and wait for the proper time of harvest. You have to be willing to let the growth happen on God's time. I think too many times our prayers uh, feel like more like orders from Amazon Prime than they do like uh, wish lists that we might give to our kids, our parents when we were growing up. You know, you'd say, okay, I want XX and X for Christmas. You know, give me all these things. And maybe you get one thing off that list, but it's because that's what your parents decided was right for you. And now, we're also used to just pop open the phone, pick the whole thing I want, and I'll get it in two days, as long as I, you know, have my Prime subscription paid up. God is not looking to satisfy our whims, but He's looking to fulfill our lives with meaning based on the blessings he gives us. Job went on, with all these new kids he had, to teach them to be righteous just like he was. Now it was up to them to get the attitude of heart, but the blessings that Job had presumably were passed on. And we have to have the same attitude. Be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against each other, brothers, for you will be judged, and the judge is standing at the door. And above all, my brothers, do not swear by heaven or by earth or anything else, but let your yes be yes, and your no, no, or you will be condemned. We don't need to make deals with God. We don't have to say, I promise I'll do this if you'll just give me this, God. We don't have to make oaths against our good fortune in order to get God to give us what we want. He's already promised us salvation if we'll just be faithful and humble and understand where our blessings are coming from. You know, one of the things that's remarkable about the book of Job for me is that throughout the entire text, I can only find one prayer at all from Job. Now, you can do your own study and tell me if I'm wrong. But as I was reading through that book, I could only find one thing that Job prayed for, except for maybe at the very end when he repents towards God. And that was he wished God would kill him. He prayed to God, I just want to die because none of this is worth putting up with. Are we trying to make deals with God to get out of what he wants us to do? Or are we thanking him for how much he's given us all the opportunities we have to demonstrate his righteousness in our lives. So if, if we find ourselves to be righteous 
before the Lord, correct in all of our actions, law-abiding, blameless before the commands of God, then the only thing that we have to correct is the posture of our hearts and make sure our humility is matching with what God is looking for as well. I hope this lesson has been beneficial for you today. I always find the poetic way that God's power is described in Job to be uplifting, if nothing else. Uh, so I, I hope it's been something that was edifying to the congregation. Uh, if you need to be subject to uh, God's uh, power and humbly join with Him in baptism, we can offer that now, uh, as we traditionally do. Or if you need prayers to the church for restoration or encouragement, you can come forward now as we stand and sing.